So I thought I'd take a few minutes this morning to talk about the Jewish festival of Passover and provide a little information that will contextualize the homily that I'll deliver a bit later in the service. So I want to begin by asking how many people here have ever been to a Passover Seder? A lot. All right. How many people have never been to a Passover Seder? A lot, too. Good. So I I hit my remarks just so if it was all like on one side, then I would have just like skip this part. I would have said, oh, you, don't, you don't need this. I'll just go sit down. Let's sing again. Or um, if like nobody had been, then, then I'd probably need to go a little bit. So this will be a kind of at that mid-level. Passover is a Jewish festival celebrating and commemorating the exodus from Egypt. Moses rising up, telling Pharaoh to let his people go, and leading the Israelites out of Egypt across the Red Sea and into the desert where according to the biblical tradition, they would wander for 40 years before arriving in the promised land. Um, And uh, I was recently told that actually, you know, this probably is not exactly how it happened uh, because the the Sinai Peninsula, to to walk across it would take about three days. Um, And so so to kind of wander lost for 40 years um, would be be really quite difficult. Passover, uh, the eight-day festival of Passover, um, begins this Friday, and in Judaism, especially in the post-temple era, Passover is celebrated in the home, not in the synagogue. It's celebrated with the ritualized retelling of the story of the Exodus. Family and friends gather and follow the Haggadah, literally the telling, which leads them through the ritual of the Seder. Um, part of, parts of the Seder typically include lighting candles, spoken blessings and prayers, songs, readings, games, a meal, and the ritualized eating of special foods, including unleavened bread, bitter herbs, salt water, a blend of apples, walnuts, and honey, it's called heroset, and four glasses of wine. Seders are intentionally multi-generational and include a place for children's participation in the readings, songs, and games. And one of the places for children's participation is in the asking of the four questions. And during our offertory this morning, we're actually going to have our choir is going to present a sung version of the four questions. The ritual is explicitly designed to teach Jewish history and identity to children And there are, depending on your tradition, various versions of the Haggadah that you may follow. There are feminist Haggadahs, there are queer-friendly Haggadahs, and various other kinds as well. Larry Ross in our choir sent me um, the Haggadah that was used at his old Unitarian church in St. Louis. And that, I, I put it side by side, and it differs markedly from the Unitarian Universalist Haggadah that I'd always used, which came from a UU church in Illinois. Um, and they differ in length. Some of them might take about three hours to complete, and some of them are, are quite a bit shorter than that. I want to make one point about the experience of the Passover Seder. Just as the Seder tells the story of moving from bondage to freedom, the Seder begins with bitterness and moves towards sweetness and joy. At the beginning of the service, early in the retelling, is when you eat the bitter herbs, the horseradish, and you dip parsley in the salt water and eat it. It's tasting those tears and that bitterness. But towards the end, you gradually move over to the sweet stuff, the wonderful mixture of walnuts and apples and and honey, more of the wine, the matzah bread. But at the same time, the text of the Haggadah recognizes that this move towards freedom is not just something that happened once in the ancient past, but it's still a movement that's happening in the world. The service frequently ends with a cheerful and hopeful toast next year in Jerusalem, or as one Unitarian Universalist Haggadah puts it, The toast goes, next year in a world of peace and justice. Either way, the Seder observes that something more is needed, despite all of the freedom that has been achieved, that we are not yet fully liberated or fully free or fully redeemed, at least not all of us. 
But next year, next year, we're going to get there. So those are a few reflections about the experience of the Passover Seder. Um, as the choir comes forth once more, this is the point in the service where our ushers will come around to both uh, give and receive the morning offering. Um, the morning offering this morning is, of course, uh, share the plate for OK. And I invite you to give generously. The way in which we commonly think about freedom may be problematic. There's a scholar of Judaism, a very well regarded one, John Levinson of, of Harvard University, who once wrote something very controversial about the Exodus and Passover. He said that the Exodus, the story of deliverance from slavery in Egypt, is not a story about freedom. He says that the story of the Exodus is really about the transfer of ownership of a people from a life as property of an illegitimate ruler to life under a legitimate ruler. He says the story of the Exodus is really about the transfer of ownership of a people from life as property of an illegitimate ruler, Pharaoh, to life under a legitimate one, God, Yahweh. Controversial interpretation, right? So what Levinson argues is that what the Israelites find when they reach the other side of the Red Sea isn't freedom, at least not freedom as we would commonly think of it. You might think of it this way, that the story of the Exodus happens in just a couple of chapters in the book of Exodus. But then the rest of the book of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, they all consist of God revealing a set of rules and commandments and regulations that God's people are supposed to follow. How many rules? The Talmud, the Talmud claims that the Torah, the five books of Moses, contain 613 commandments, regulating everything from diet to hygiene to business transactions to the holding of debt. In the story of the Exodus, we actually find the Israelites complaining and grumbling, even longing to return to the days of slavery in Egypt. They discover this new freedom isn't all it's cracked up to be. So I'm not sure I completely agree with John Levinson, but I share his counterintuitive perspective with you because I want to problematize. I want to muddy our thinking about freedom a little bit. We're used to thinking about freedom in black and white absolutes. Slavery in Egypt, but then cross the Red Sea and freedom. Slavery in the American South, but then the Emancipation Proclamation, freedom. Segregation, then civil rights. Apartheid, then freedom. Economic exploitation, then economic justice. Political repression, then freedom. I could go on and on, but we think about these things as either entirely one or entirely the other. And there is some truth to understanding freedom in this way. We, we obviously know, looking at the victim of human trafficking or the person in prison or the person in a refugee camp or the person excluded and disenfranchised under the law, we can easily say exactly how that person is lacking in freedom. But freedom may not be as simple as these very obvious examples would make it seem. True freedom, true liberation, we might say, might also have a spiritual component to it, or an educational component, or a psychological component, or a mental component to it. It's not as simple as chains or no chains. I think of that Bob Marley line, Emancipate yourself from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. It's a much more complicated understanding of freedom. We can, we can see actual physical chains, but, but mental chains, how do, we, how do we see those? How do we recognize those? And so what I want to do is I want to make reference to two religious news stories from this past week that illustrate, I think, some of the challenges of thinking about freedom and liberation in, in our world today. 
The first news story is one that many of you probably didn't hear about, which is just as well. In fact, I'd rather not bring it up. Um, and, and what happened is, is that, that down this past week, down in Vero Beach, Florida, there was this prayer breakfast that was held, and the guy who they found to be the speaker at the prayer breakfast was this reality television star from like some show called Duck Dynasty. And, and, and so during the talk, during the talk or prayer or whatever, he begins telling this story from his own imagination, and the story is graphic and gruesome and violent and very disturbing. Um, and the point that the Duck Dynasty dude, I think, was trying to make was about the necessity of moral laws. And he, he claimed that atheists, because they lack a divinely given moral code, are unable to say that there's anything that's wrong or anything that's right with the graphic events that he described, which, of course, we know is utter hogwash, right? We know that that's ridiculous, that every atheist I've ever met has a pretty developed sense or of right and wrong and not a lot of shyness about sharing opinions. <laughs> The whole atheists have no moral standards is, is a patently false claim. It's also interesting because it's an argument that's quite old. And what's interesting to me is that 200 years ago, a universalist minister was posed this kind of similar Duck Dynasty type of question. Um, Hosea Ballou, it's a, it's a great story. Hosea Ballou, one of the most influential universalist thinkers of the 19th century in the early, 1900, in the early 1800s, describes traveling uh, by horseback alongside, sort of as his traveling companion, was a, a more orthodox minister. And, and the two of them, the universalist and the orthodox minister, they have a theological conversation. Um, and at one point, the orthodox minister turns to Ballou and asks him, so if you don't believe in a God who holds over you the threat of eternal punishment, what is stopping you from killing me right now and stealing my horse? Which couldn't have been really a comfortable moment in the conversation. You know, if, if you have to ask your traveling conversation, so uh, your traveling companion, so what, what's stopping you from killing me right now? And Baloo responds, he says, because I'm a universalist, the thought never even crossed my mind. <laughs> the corollary of this is to say that if the only thing that's keeping someone from killing you and taking your horse is their fear in God, then I hope that person stays strong in their faith. <laughs> so that kind of brutal fantasy in Florida, the Orthodox minister's question, both, I think, reveal a kind of fear of freedom, a fear of freedom, a fear that freedom will lead to destructiveness and utter chaos. And there is, there is that, that, that fear of freedom, that fear that we are naturally drawn to evil and destructiveness and violence and chaos, but it's only by rules and laws and surveillance from God or from government. That's the only thing that keeping, keeping us from utter self-annihilation. And there is, I think, that fear of freedom alive in much of our discourse. It's not only a fear of freedom, it's the fear of atheist amorality or universalist immorality is, is also, I think, also a fear of difference, a fear of otherness, a fear of diversity and pluralism, a lack of trust, a lack of trust that permeates this discussion. Franklin Roosevelt, in his famous Four Freedoms speech, said that the four core freedoms are freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. Freedom from fear. How do you eliminate fear? Too often the answer has been by trying to you know, purge the people that we're afraid of. But a better way, it turns out, a better way is by purging your own self of hatred Racism, sexism, homophobia, religious bigotry. The other news story about religion and freedom from this past week is a, a lot more newsworthy. It involves the governor of Indiana signing into law a so-called religious freedom bill. 
And it's true that 19 other states have, have religious freedom laws on the book. Heck, our, our country has some sort of religious freedom law on its books. But it's also true that Indiana's new law seems to be both the vaguest and most threatening and most far-reaching. Critics of the law assert, and I think quite rightly, that the freedom, religious freedom law amounts to a freedom to discriminate law. The law seems to open up the possibility that, that someone could avoid a legal claim of discrimination by saying, by claiming that they were acting on their sincerely held religious beliefs. And so people wonder, and it'll be up for the courts to decide as they interpret it, what exactly this means. Does it mean that a baker can refuse to bake a wedding cake for a gay or lesbian couple because they don't approve of the rights of gays to marry? Could it mean that you wouldn't allow a gay couple to stay at your hotel or eat at your restaurant? What about refusing to serve African Americans? What about denying retail sales to women or putting up a sign that says Muslims or Jews or atheists not welcome in this place of business? Or what about a police officer refusing an assignment to provide security at a parade or at a mosque or at a synagogue? What about a hospital turning away a patient who has AIDS? Is any of this what's intended by religious freedom? We tend to suffer at this time from an immature idea of freedom. Freedom too often is taken to mean I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, and nobody has the right to tell me what to do or force me to do something that I don't want to do. Because freedom. But to cloak, to cloak such immaturity or such bigotry in the language of piety is an insult, I think, to the real meaning of religious freedom. So when, when John Levinson argued that the Exodus isn't fundamentally a freedom story, he was rejecting that immature notion of freedom. When the Israelites crossed the Red Sea and into the desert of the Sinai Peninsula, the freedom that they gained wasn't in in Levinson's mind, in my mind, you know, the freedom to oppress, the freedom to forget history, the freedom to grow ignorant, the freedom to murder, the freedom to do whatever you want to do. And our freedom, our freedom is also likewise not without civic responsibility. It's not without responsibility to others in society. It is not without sort of this compelling move to unity, this sense that we're in it together. I think that our idea of freedom, the idea of the freedom that we hold, is forming but not yet fully formed to which I say, next year. Next year in a world of peace and justice. May it be so.